first session of the design and education track uh, for uh, room four, if that's where you're supposed to be, that's, that's where we are. We have three great talks uh, this session from uh, Brandon Wong, Madonna Yoder, and uh, uh, Robert will be giving the last one on behalf of uh, Musun Tsai. Uh, so I think we're going to try to keep it to 15 minutes per talk and five minutes of questions afterwards. Uh, I'll try to give the speaker a little bit of warning before we get to that deadline, okay? Any questions for our, before we begin? No? Okay, let's welcome our first speaker, Brandon Wong from MIT. And today we're talking about Hensbleeding and some of the new updates that we have that can increase the functionality of Hensbleeding for representational design. Um, so as a high level, Hensbleeding has two variants. There's the uniaxial Hensbleeding and the non-uniaxial Hensbleeding. Just like the box bleeding and other things. So as a show of hands, just to get a few, raise your hand if you've designed a box bleeding model before. Okay, good. So a lot of people. So that, that's very helpful because Hensbleeding is very similar uh, in a lot of ways. So, as an overview of what we're talking about, we're going to do a brief introduction to hex splitting. And then we'll look at uniaxial hex splitting specifically, and then some non uniaxial hex splitting. All right, so first of all, what is hex splitting? Well, as uh, Robert Lang has eloquently put in his book, Organ Design Secrets, he describes it as a form of polygon packing in which the major creases run at multiples of 30 degrees relative, relative to one another. So, of course, this definition is referring to specifically uniaxial hex splitting which we can expand and make non-uniaxial hex splitting that is not using polygon packing. But the gist of hex splitting is that the creases are relative 30 degrees relative to each other. Okay. And so the way we do that is we would apply the creases onto an isometric grid of equilateral triangles. And so the creases are either on the grid lines or the angle bisectors of the grid lines. And in doing so, we can ensure it's, um, some uh, symmetry. In uniaxial um, designs, so this is not specific to hex splitting, the box splitting point to five is all the same. All creases can be categorized into three types, ridge, hinge, and axial creases. So the hinge creases, such as uh, this pattern that's all the blue lines, are the outlines of the blocking of the contract. So the, each hinge crease is used to outline some polygon, and each polygon represents a, a flap or a river in the tree. We then have our axial creases, which, when folded flat, will fly along the axis. And by definition, they need to be parallel with the hinges. And lastly, we have our bridge creases, which are the straight skeletons of each polygon. Um, so, one thing that we need to cover is how do we want to draw our grid? So, there are two ways we can do this. This one we can call a hinge grid because on this isometric grid, the hinge, the hinge creases all lie on grid lines. Uh, and in contrast, the axial creases, because they are by definition 90 degrees, must need to lie on the angle bisectors of the grid. Alternatively, we could do it such that the axial creases are the creases that lie on grids, and the hinge creases are the ones that are angle bisectors. So if you've read Oregon Design Secrets, you'll see these crease patterns, um, but perhaps, this way will be a little bit more convenient. The most practical reason is because when you fold a model, the first step is usually to fold the grid. And as you can see, axial creases make up the majority of the creases in the crease pattern. So simply folding the grid gives you most of the tree creases right off the bat. We will see other reasons why this grid is a little bit more useful. Um, mainly is the fact that you can have uh, more precise grid, or more precise flat lines. So rather than being discretized into four units like this, here we actually are discretized into six units. And furthermore, we can do things in half. So we can have a four and a half unit flap or five and a half unit flap, which gives us more flexibility and more precision in our tree. Um, also, just for clarity, we have length units, which just correspond to the length of a flap, and we'll have width units, which correspond to the width of a flap, and they are off by a factor of square root of three. We will also have two types of ridges. So in box splitting, all the ridges are 45 degrees, as I'm sure you know. In hex splitting, we can have ridges that are 30 degrees from the axis and some that are 60 degrees from the axis. For convenience, we'll call these steep ridges, because if you can imagine yourself walking up this hill, it's very steep. And these guys we'll call shallow ridges for the opposite reason. One thing to notice, oh, I have demos. So this is a shallow ridge, 
Um, as you can tell, it takes up a lot of a lot less paper. Um, compared to this, which is a lot more efficient. So essentially, this is uh, approximating the circle using an equilateral triangle, and this one approximates the circle using hexagon. So obviously, the hexagon is more efficient. So now let's dive into some of the more newer techniques of, of uniaxial hex splitting. Everything up to now was just a review. So another review. I'm sure most of you know this already, but when designing uniaxial models, so using circle packing, box splitting, or hex splitting, we're going to start with a tree figure. Then we'll pack it, so each block represents a polygon. Then we'll turn this packing into a crease pattern, then we'll fold it, and we'll have our final model. Uh, and this dragon is downstairs if you want to see it. So for packing, uh, we have a set of flaps with each of our polygon, and we're going to make sure that they pile the plane exactly so that there are no gaps and no overlaps. Uh, same thing for rivers. So in hex splitting, as I mentioned before, you can have a combination of steep ridges and shallow ridges, uh, and you can combine them in these, these funky ways. Um, so this is nothing new. So now let's take this and apply it to the axial grid as mentioned before. So suppose we have some tree like this. It seems fairly reasonable. For, we have integer lengths. Uh, but when we attempt to pack it, we might end up with something like this. So as I mentioned before, the steep ridges are the more efficient ones. So perhaps we want to use as many steep ridges as we can. But even disregarding this, this blatant empty space here, one major problem is that these ridges are not ending in a grid point. See how this, these two degree circle points, the ridges end in the middle of a cell? <coughs> so this is a problem. It's not possible to make a crease pattern. So as a roundabout way of solving it, let's take a, look, a closer look at these two types of bridges. So on a steep ridge, uh, one steep ridge, one full ridge, because we want integer numbers, will give us one and a half length units of a flap. Uh, in contrast, one shallow ridge will give us half the length unit of a flap. And so it turns out that we can combine these and use some number of shallow ridges and some number of steep ridges to create a flap length that is some number of times 0.5 and some number of times 1.5. And in this manner, um, if before, if we were just limited to this, we would only be able to make flaps that are multiples of 1.5. If we were only limited to shallow ridges, we would be able to make any flap length we like, but it's a lot less efficient. And by combining them, we can get both the precision of the shallow ridges, but also the efficiency of the steep ridges. So to apply that, we can take this faulty packing and add selectively add some shallow ridges to some of the flaps. And now we'll see that all the ridges end on grid points and we can make a crease pattern, which is flat. So the, the gist of this is that being able to combine shallow ridges and steep ridges, which again is something that's unique to hex splitting, allows you to have much more precise um, flat lengths in your design. Next, we'll talk about a new technique called ridge sliding. So as I just mentioned, you can combine shallow ridges and steep ridges. So suppose you have a flap such as this. When you fold this, one thing you can do is you can squash them. So your tree used to just be a single flap. Now your tree has these little things sticking out, so it's like a comb. And we can actually squash these even further. And the further we squash these, we'll notice that the flaps go further down into the base of the flap, and they become wider. Uh, so why do we care? Oh, sorry, one more thing. We can also do them at increments of one and a half units. So we can be very precise about where our flaps are, uh, these half unit flaps are going to end up. So why do we care? So here's an example of uh, using scales. So if you've ever folded the region 3.5, you know that leg scales are quite annoying. So this is an alternative <laughs> way to do it. So essentially, this flap used to be one long shallow ridge. Then we'll squash it and move the pleats down towards the base of the leg. And as it moves down, it becomes wider. And now that gives us enough width to just take some level shifters. And now we have scales. Uh, and so what's cool is that um, this whole thing did not affect anywhere else in the crease pattern. It's completely localized to the flap. And also, it didn't take any extra paper. We just used the ridges that we already had, and we're able to add extra details. Um, OK, so another interesting thing about shallow ridges and steep ridges is that it gives us much more flexibility in our space allocation. So suppose we are designing this human stick figure. And the most optimal, most efficient way is with the steep ridges, the hexagons. So let's say we make each flap a hexagon and we're left with these red spots of empty space we need to fill. If this were a box splitting, what you'd have to do is you'd have to either use a river meander or you'd have to fill it with empty flaps that aren't used, neither of which is a great option. 
hex bidding, we, we can do the same thing, except our river meanders are actually using shallow ridges. And as we just discussed, shallow ridges can be used to do um, the ridge washing and then do some new scales or textures and are used more effectively. So this is one way you can do it, we're using the river. So for example, if you're designing a human figure with maybe clothes details or armor, you can use this approach. Alternatively, if you wanted to put the extra paper into the limbs, so head and legs, you can do that. And um, so yeah, this is a, a, yeah. So basically, shallow ridges can be used to selectively absorb paper to the feature plate. So you get a lot more flexibility as a designer to add details to different features without having to create new blocks <coughs> or anything like that. Um, so you may have heard that hex bidding is more efficient than moss bidding. And you might suppose that this is because the hexagon approximates the circle better than the square. Well, that's true. Uh, with, with Pythagoras stretches, the difference becomes negligible. However, the difference in efficiency comes not from being able to approximate a circle, but rather being able to utilize all the space. So no space goes unused when you execute. So instead of having wasted space, you're able to use the space and make something into your model that's more useful. Uh, as a bonus, Pythagoras stretches do exist in hex spinning. But because the hexagon approximates the circle so well, you don't really need to use it. All right. Finally, we're going to look into some of the non-uniaxial aspects of hex splitting. So first, we have ridge level shifters. Uh, these level shifters are basically the same as box splitting, and in fact, they are just a special case of a universal algorithm, which you can <coughs> learn more about in uh, tomorrow's presentation. We also have perpendicular feed level shifters, which I don't suppose gives a more official name, but as a reference, this is what it looks like in box bidding. So to shift it one unit up, it takes a feed that is one unit wide. In contrast, here if we're shifting a one width unit up, we actually only take one in square one over square root of three of a width of a flat. So this feed uh, saves a lot more space to get the same width of the level shifter. So another thing is that this width is exactly the same width that you get from squashing your ridge bevel. So the, the gist of it is, is that you can create level shifters without having to sacrifice extra paper for your feet. In fact, it's baked in with your shallow ridges. Um, but otherwise, these are basically the same as their box bidding counterparts. Oh, yeah. Finally, we're going to look at some of the 3D um, non-uniaxial hex bidding. So we can call these representational polyhedra because they're polyhedra, but they're also representational. As the name says. Uh, these examples are also downstairs. So the key difference between hex bidding and box bidding in regards to 3D models is the angular defect. So the angle defect refers to, uh, for example, if you have a flat paper, that's zero defect. If you have a paper that has a higher defect, it becomes more like a cone, it becomes more steeper, more sharper. Uh, and if it uh, has a less defect, it becomes more like a more, more flat. So in box bidding, if you want a three-dimensional vertex, it has to look like this. There's really no other option. So the angular defect for a box bidding 3D model has to be 90, like a cube. Um, so I have a demo here. It just looks like a cube. And of course, you can squish it around and mold it, but the angular defect is always is always 90. In contrast, in high splitting, we can have some points that are angular defect of 60 degrees. So if you imagine uh, like an ice cosahedron, it's a little bit more flexible. It's uh, more rounder than this cube. And if you needed to, you can also have angular defect of 120, like an octahedron. So here it's more sharper, uh, and you can use them in, a, in combination in your models to create different 3D features. So overall, it becomes a lot more organic rather than being like voxelized like this. You can have a lot more flexibility and more like softer curves in, in your model using uh, hex bidding in this way. So um, that's all I have. Uh, if you guys have any questions, thank you very much. Excellent talk on uh, your techniques for hex pleating. I have one question for, I don't do a lot of uh, hex pleated design. There's a lot of ways you could choose to align a hex grid onto a square, and we like folding from squares. So do you have any recommendations for people on how to best utilize that yeah. alignment? Yeah, well, there, there are a lot of ways, and there's no like real one way. Um, the way that I just have a that <laughs> It's outside. Okay, so, so like this. Box. So yep. the way that I do it, just for convenience sake, from a folder's perspective, is to start with the vertical pleats being the ones that are exactly eights. So the problem with hex pleating, as some of you might know, is that it will never fit exactly into a square because um, square root of three. So you will end up with one edge that is not not exactly lining up, 
Um, but for convenience, I like to make it so that the vertical pleats are the ones that line up exactly, and then we have one edge that's maybe a little bit off. Um, but one edge is not a lot to worry about, so this is the way I would recommend, but there are plenty of other ways to do it. Great. Uh, a few more minutes for questions. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Yes. So, um, I like this approach. Uh, <laughs> I remember seeing um, in the world of, of triangulation of polyhedra that um, people working on the problem of taking an arbitrary smooth shape, triangulating it just with equilateral triangles rather than arbitrary triangles. And it seems like a marriage of that approach with what you're doing would be like origamizer but easily foldable. Mm, yeah. <laughs> cool. that, that's not very interesting. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on uh, being able to use some of these techniques for yeah. generally making 3D forms? I mean, you have a lot of experience uh, folding these three dimensional boxy things with a hex grid. Yeah, I think the only challenge uh, that can immediately come up with is maybe the saddle points. So, for example, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> this point behind the neck, this is a saddle point that's not necessarily super straightforward to be able to get like a positive angular defect or so to speak on your paper. But other than that, I, I definitely think that um, it's a very viable option. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions for Brandon? No questions? People are trying to transition to the next room. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Joseph? Just your your example that you're holding in your hand right now with the, oh sorry not that one but if the box pleated one yeah. yes um, and you said that that point will always that vertex will always be on degrees but you're being very strict then with your definition of box pleated sure. is that is that why yeah well because I can, you can easily change the angle and create a more shallow or more with more shaping I guess yeah. right right that's not exactly <coughs> shaping either but it is following the box pleating grid. Exactly. So, right. So, so the, the crease pattern will look like like this, right? If you wanted a different angular defect, you need to be not 49 degrees, which yeah. you could do. But um, in general, this this is the most straightforward way to do it. Okay. So you, you're just restricting it to strict box pleating. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I just wanted to make sure I understood the definition. Yeah. The question? Uh, yeah. So with the ridge sliding, yeah. so is that do you think it's more efficient to do that like in hex pleating or in the compared to box pleating? Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly, yeah. So, so it is possible, possible to do a box fitting. Um, but because the ridge in box fitting is limited to 45 degrees, uh, the flaps are going to be a lot smaller and a lot more spaced out. So you can do it, and in fact, there are people who have, but it's just a lot more annoying to work with. Um, <laughs> in contrast, these ones are exactly um, one, and one half units long, so you can easily use them for level shifters and things like that, and it'll, it'll work out very easily. And the box fitting, the length of that flap will be something like the square root of 2 minus 1, which is uh, not as friendly. Any other questions for Brandon? Okay, we'll have a couple minutes for transition to the next talk. Thank, uh, let's join me in uh, thanking Brandon.